Hey, folks, welcome back to the Change Physician Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Kevin Kukaro, with my wonderful co-host, Dr. Melissa Cady, and our fantastic guest, Dr. Stephanie Pearson. And today, our returning guest is going to be talking about a very important topic, one that I know a lot of physicians get confused on, um, and probably some of the people who aren't confused, probably should be confused so that they're asking the right questions because we're going to talk about disability insurance and the importance of, of, of having it and what to look for in policy concerns that you have as a physician. And there is no better person to talk about this than Dr. Stephanie Pearson. So Stephanie, thank you so, so much for coming back on the show today. It is a pleasure to talk to you again. As well for me. All right. Well, let's just start at the beginning. So what is disability insurance? So at its most basic, disability insurance is income replacement insurance. And so I talk to folks regularly about the other insurances that we tend to have without even thinking about it, right? If I'm in a room full of people and I say, hey, how many of you have health insurance? And let me preface with a room of physicians, right? <laughs> Everybody's hands go up. How many of you have car insurance? Everyone's hands go up. How about homeowners or renters insurance? Most people's hands go up. And how about engagement rings? And you'd be surprised at how many hands go up. And then I say, how about disability insurance? And all of a sudden it's crickets. Maybe it's a fourth of the room. Maybe it's a little bit more depending on how they've been educated. But we often don't think about what truly is our biggest asset. And our biggest asset is our ability to earn income and take care of ourselves and our families. And it's something that somehow has been overlooked for a long period of time. Going back to when I was a resident, I don't remember anybody talking about it. I think that has changed in the last several years, but I don't think that it's become part of our normal vernacular yet. And, and it's interesting because, you know, people, almost everybody knows what life insurance is, whether or not you're carrying any. And yet, um, and, and please correct me, or give the proper statistics, I'm sure you know them, we're more likely to become disabled than to die. Correct. And, and it, what, I mean, it, I, I, I remember when I heard the, the statistics, I can't remember anymore, it was shocking to me, but, but how much likelier are we to become disabled than to die? So according to the American with Disabilities, group. What I've heard, what I've seen, depending on what website you look at, is that most folks have a one in four to one in five chance of becoming disabled during their employment career. Now, part of me is curious if that number is a little bit inflated, truth be told, because it's all comers. And you would assume that there are certain uh, job sectors where injury might be more prevalent, where illness due to associated um, chemicals and, and whatnot would be greater. But the other myth that is perpetrated continuously is that injury is the main reason that people go out. And that's actually a very small percentage of what takes folks out. It's usually more illness related musculoskeletal, um, neoplasm, mental health, issues related to pregnancy. You know, these are the things that are really taking folks out of work. Um, I'm just, I'm curious about maybe this, um, when it comes to disability, there's, there's some people that are employed that get, you know, like this group disability versus this individual policy that they might get for themselves all on their own. Do you mind just describing kind of like kind of typical scenarios of what people assume they have or what, you know, what they find out later that, you know, they didn't understand? Absolutely. So group benefits come in two flavors. You have employer benefits and you have association benefits. So association benefits, the AMA, the American Academy of fill in the blank, right? These policies are the ones where we get the bombarded emails still through snail mail. Truth be told, they're being blessed because somebody's paying to have them be blessed. They're often not in our best 
um, interest. And that has to do with how they're designed, language, pricing, all of that stuff. Employer benefits come in a multitude of flavors. The two most common are employer paid or employee paid. And then there's often a mixture of two where part of it they may cover and say, hey, you can buy, buy up. Meaning, for instance, the employer paid policy is 50% of your base income. You can buy up to 60 or 70%, right? And so now there's a little bit of a mix. There are, I would say, three really big issues that we run into with group benefits where they are somewhat inferior to private policies. It has to do with taxation, ownership, and terminology or language. So taxation, most folks don't understand or realize that if your employer is paying for your benefit, any money that you would get from that benefit is actually taxable income. Whereas if you're paying for the policy, whether it's group or private, the money's gonna come to you tax-free. So there's a big difference between money that's getting taxed and money that's not getting taxed. Secondly, has to do with ownership. Whether you're paying for it or your employer's paying for it, if it is a group benefit, the employer controls it or owns it, meaning they control how it's designed, what's in it, what's not in it, and you have no say. And most of the time, it's employment dependent. So if you decide that you and your employer are not a great match anymore and you move on, they keep it. Now, I'm gonna asterisk just about everything that I say with there are always exceptions to the rule. I'm gonna paint really broad strokes. Um, so that's the ownership piece in that private policy is you're in charge of, you own it, you control it, you keep it, you know, it goes with you. And so there's a term called portability that gets thrown around a lot. It's basically the idea that it follows you wherever you go. I, I like to say it grows up with you, right? So wherever you decide to go in the country, it's going to be um, enforced. So that's a big deal. The biggest though has to do with language. And it's really important to realize that there's no standardization of language in the insurance industry like there is in medicine. Companies can use the same phrasing and define it differently, or they can use different phrases and define it similarly. And it gets confusing. And part of me thinks it might be on purpose to keep lay people confused. And so you may get told that your policy is own occupation because let's face it, it's usually one line in your open enrollment packet with a box that you check, right? But when you look into the actual policy, they may define it as own occupation for two to three years and then switch to any occupation. They may call it own occupation, but when you read the document, it's what's called held to the national economy or the local labor market. It is not specific to what one employee does at one employer site. So what that allows the company to do is cast this really wide net that says, this is what you would, could, should be able to do based on your training, education, and skill set, which is not ideal for most of us. And often they'll define total disability as in order to be totally disabled, you have to both be unable to do your job as they define it and not gainfully employed. And for most of us, that definition is terrible. You know, I have the utmost respect for stay at home parents. I am not hardwired to be one. I used to say the adage, I'd give my left arm to be home with my boys more. I gave my left arm to be home with my boys more and after about six weeks wanted to kill everybody. So you don't want to have to worry about losing a benefit because you're trying to be productive and figure something out. And they've gotten really creative at things that they're not going to cover. So said exclusions, 
it's pretty standard for group benefits to have a one or two year limitation on mental health and substance abuse. Um, there's now this new group of illnesses that they either call psychosomatic or subjective, and it's including, but not limited to headaches, pain, fatigue, um, ringing in the ears, things where there may not be a pathognomonic test or diagnosis, but it's real. I'm seeing a lot of one to two year benefits for that. Um, page out of my own history, my group benefit didn't cover work-related injuries. Uh, I was flatly denied and, and told I would have been better off had I fallen off my bike. I will say that's the exception to the rule, but not uncommon. And in the face of COVID, we're starting to see more and more group benefits that are not covering work-related injuries or illnesses, which is kind of frightening. Um, but I'm sure it's in direct um, response to COVID. I've seen a few where they're limiting, where they are limiting musculoskeletal issues, which is one of the top three reasons that physicians leave. So the devil is truly in the details and it's what is so misleading because they don't have to tell us. You have to actually request the master copy of the policy. They only have to tell us that one line that's in our packet. And another thing that I have found that a lot of um, physicians don't realize, and it's again, through no fault of their own, is that there's a limitation of benefit. And so you may think that you have 60% of your income covered, but two things can happen. It may be that it's 60% of your income up to a maximum benefit, of a certain number, whether it's 2,500 or 35,000, and they, they truly do run that gamut, or it may be 20% of your, or not 20%, whatever percentage, usually it's 50 or 60, of your base salary, which is a big issue because most of us kind of walk in with the assumption that it's our income, and especially in big university settings where the way that you get paid may be super tiered and what you think is getting covered is only a fraction of what's really getting covered. And I run into that unfortunately more often than I don't. Uh, my group benefit covered 60% of my base to a maximum benefit of $6,500. I didn't find that out until I got hurt. Um, even had I qualified for it, I was making way more than $6,500 a month, but my income was broken into a base and a bonus. And my bonus was a third of my income. And that's one of the ways that employers have figured out how to limit their liability, right? So if they put the language in that says they're only covering your base income, it gives those, you know, it gives them this latitude to create a different pay model, right? So there are a lot of things in these group benefits that nobody tells us about. And most of us have never even looked at it. So do you mind clarifying, uh, you mentioned own occupation and I don't know if everyone knows this, but the clauses that were related to either own occupation or part-time versus full-time. So okay. when I say own yeah, occupation, Okay. I, I'm going to add on to that because I was, I was going to ask the same thing. So own occupation, part-time, full-time, any op occupation, which you had mentioned, um, it, it, I guess those kind of core definitions of, of coverage, I think would be really good. Yeah. So again, it's going to be different between group policies and private policies. And I'll address kind of the private policy in a minute. With the group policy, it is going to be policy specific because again, there's no standardization of language. I think what most physicians think of when they hear own occupation, I'm going to call specialty specific. So what you do day in and day out, how you get paid, right? But as I mentioned a few minutes ago, that may not be how they define it in the group policy. Similarly with how they define any occupation, 
I have seen it as broad as based on your education, training, and skill set. I have seen it narrow where they'll say any job that will afford you 60% of your predisability earning, 80% of your predisability earnings. And so again, it's all going to depend on the given language within each policy with part-time, full-time kind of total disability, partial or residual disability. Again, and you guys aren't going to like this, it depends on each given policy. For the most part, full-time insurance speak is actually 30 hours a week. And so sometimes I'll talk to physicians who tell me that they've gone part-time, but they're still working what most the rest of the world would say is a full-time job. Some group policies will have specific um, language that they're only going to cover you if you work 28 hours or more a week. It may only be 20 hours a week. It may be 30 hours a week. And so again, that's one of those pieces where it's really important to understand what's in the policy. I will tell you from a private insurance space, 30 hours is full-time, 20 to 30 is part-time. And right now there's only one carrier in the marketplace that will cover part-time physicians. So physicians who are truly in that 20 to 30 hour work space. Um, the residual and partial disability, again, it's going to depend on the policy for most of the group benefits. It more has to do with if you're disabled and working as opposed to in the private sector where it has to do with a different definition. And again, I'll, I'll kind of keep the private stuff as its own entity um, to keep things as simple as we can. Again, I, I, I get it. This is a confusing topic, even for those of us who this is all we do all day, every day, and why I really think it's important when people are talking about disability insurance that they are talking to somebody who focuses on this because there are so many nuances. And so it changes rapidly and it's so important that, that you're speaking with somebody who really understands the product. Um, did I answer all your questions? I feel like I missed one. No, I, I think you did, and, but it's, it, it, it just makes me think, you know, I'm sort of laughing here because it's so complex and anytime you see a really complex industry, it's like, okay, well, someone's doing, I, I kind of agree, someone's doing it intentionally in a lot of ways. But I'm, I'm hearing, when, when I hear you talk, and we're talking about your employment policy versus personal policy, which we're really not talking about, or at least yet, it makes me think of almost like when you're buying at a house and the difference between a buyer's agent and a seller's agent. Correct. And so you can look at this as having their, your employment benefits. You obviously want to know what those are, but always coming from the perspective of the person who is ultimately those in policies are going to design to support and be of of ultimate benefit to is going to be the employer because that's going to be framed if you're there that's going to do it correct versus a personal policy where it's you now you have somebody who's going to look out for your best interest because it's personally relevant directly to you is is that a good way to kind of break it down a little bit or that is a great way of looking at it and i might steal that from you because i have not thought of it that way uh so thanks but yes <laughs> exactly you know from I always say that group benefits have to be cheap by design, right? Because employers have to offer it to everybody. They don't want to break the bank. And at the end of the day, they really don't want to pay, right? With private policies and kind of dealing with a broker who is like Switzerland, where there's no allegiance to any one company, the broker really should have their client's best interest at hand. And it's not a one size fits all endeavor, which I guess I'll use as a segue to get into kind of the private policy domain. It's a small playground. There are currently six traditional insurance carriers 
that cater to the physician market space and allow for specialty specific language. And I say specialty specific, try saying that five times fast, instead of own occupation, because it goes by four different names. There's regular occupation, own occupation, true own occupation, and pure own occupation. And actually, as of a week and a half ago, there is a new player in the sandbox, although I, I'm still waiting to see how they price out for physicians, but they're calling it true regular occupation. So there may be a fifth term thrown into the mix. What you want your policy's definition of total disability to be is that you're considered totally disabled in the event that you cannot do your job as you do it, regardless if you're gainfully employed in another occupation. So the way that the carriers will traditionally dictate what your specialty specific, uh, what your specific specialty is matters at two different times in the life of a private policy at time of purchase, because it creates what's called your occupational class, which is their internal risk mitigation dialogue. So every single type of physician gets tunneled into one of a handful of classes and each carrier has their own language. And so what that does is kind of help the company with what your risk mitigation is. So what's your likelihood of going out on claim? And it shouldn't come as a surprise that it's more expensive to cover an anesthesiologist than it is to cover a pediatrician, right? More importantly, it's at time of claim. It's when you come and say, hey, look, something bad happened. I can't do my job. The way that most of the carriers will do their bidding is they're gonna pull your billing and your schedule for the two to three years leading up to your claim. And that's what's gonna dictate what your specialty is. They realize that people's jobs morph and change over time. And the fact of the matter is you wanna be covered for what it is you do, how you do it, where you do it, when you do it. And if you can't do that, you wanna be covered. So first and foremost, the most important piece of an individual policy is that language. Then we get into kind of what are the other pieces of the puzzle that, that create the right picture, right? So every company has money sitting somewhere that we have access to moving forward as your income ascends, if you change jobs and lose a group benefit, that we can keep pace without having to give additional medical information. So part of every policy option when you get it is medical underwriting. So you may have to give up some bodily fluids. You absolutely have to answer a million medical questions a million times. They're gonna look in your pharmacy records, your driving history. It's really intrusive, invasive, call it what you want. There's no secrets from insurance companies. I don't, I don't even know how they find out everything that they find out, but they do. And the goal is to only have to go through that one time. So everybody has money sitting somewhere. I refer to it as the kiddie pool. So, you know, the plastic kiddie pools that we put in our yards and throw our toddlers in. That's what I refer to it. It literally goes by five different names. And so you just want to make sure that you have the ability to increase later without additional underwriting. Right now, Depending on what kind of physician you are, you should be able to get between $17,000 a month in total coverage, actually up to $35,000 a month in total coverage. So the next question should be, well, how do they decide, right? How, how do we come up with these numbers? It's a little bit different in training and out of training. Interestingly enough, when we're in training, we're allowed to be overinsured. So they have resident packages. They have something called starting practice limits where there's a little gray window between 
if you're six months from graduating training, six months into your first job, where they may not look at outside factors and everybody qualifies for a certain amount. Once you're outside of that window and you're in attending, it's based on internal algorithms that look at how much money do you make, what benefits do you get and who pays for them? And then they spit out a number. We're not allowed to be overinsured. We can thank our elders uh, who in the 80s, uh, when medicine kind of changed greatly in how physicians got reimbursed, there was a huge upswing in bike accidents, golf accidents, et cetera. And they just decimated the insurance space. And that's why there aren't that many players in it anymore. Um, but we're not allowed to be overinsured as attendings. And so it's not a function of, but I want more, I'll pay more. They have rules against this is how much we're willing to cover you for and sorry. So that's the second piece is that pool of money. There is something called a partial or residual benefit, which is a little bit different than from the group side. This is a benefit that kicks in if a physician says, oh, pardon my hiccup. If a physician says, look, you can really do your job, but maybe the hours that you're working, the patient volume, the shifts, not sustainable, but you can really do what you have to do. Every company has language as to how and when they're going to kick in to help you earn back some of your losses. Shouldn't come as a surprise that there are a multitude of definitions. Some kick in when you've lost 15% of your income. Some kick in when you've lost 20% of your income. And there's varying degrees of, of how they're going to pay you back. Again, you're never going to be covered at 100%. There has to be a theoretical incentive for people to get back to work. So that's actually uh, of note. There are more of those claims filed and paid every year rather than total. And it makes sense. If you think about it, there are so many disease processes that take time to kind of progress, like things that cause fatigue, right? So MS, other autoimmune diseases, early degenerative diseases, trying to work through chemotherapy where you really can do your job, but you just can't do it the way, you, you know, for the length of time that you're used to. Um, then there are some caveats to that. Again, there are exceptions to everything. There is something called a cost of living adjustment or COLA, which is supposed to be inflationary protection, dollar today, dollar 10 years from now. That's going to kick in when you go on claim. So you're sick or injured, they're paying you as you hit your anniversary. The benefit goes up based on the language and the policy. Again, different definitions. Some are simple, some are compounded, some are fixed, some are based on something called the consumer price index that the feds come up with. So again, there are many. There is something called a catastrophic benefit, which is exactly what it sounds like in the event that what takes you out leaves you unable to perform two or more of your activities of daily living without assistance, or you're severely cognitively impaired, you would get an additional benefit. So it becomes kind of X plus Y. Some of the companies make you purchase the right language. Some it's built in. Some we have to pick before the software lets us continue. So the summaries don't line up. And the single biggest difference right now amongst the carriers has to do with how they treat mental health and substance abuse. It is predicated by carrier by state and by what kind of doctor you are. And it ranges from a two-year aggregate benefit up to and including the length of the policy. So, you know, if you guys are ready to poke your eyeballs out yet, I get it. You know, there's zero standardization here. There are so many nuances and it is not a one size fits all. It, it's kind of maddening uh, I will also point out, which I probably should have pointed out in the beginning, 
unfortunately, it is more expensive for women than it is for men. Life insurance is the opposite. It's more expensive for men. It's not quite as sexist as it would appear at first glance. It is based in real actuarial data. Women have historically across all fields left the workforce more often than men because of injury or illness. Men have historically died younger and more successfully at their own hands. So that's where the price gradient comes from. Um, you know, women that are listening, do yourself a favor. Don't compare notes with your male colleagues. You will get very unhappy. <laughs> um, one little question about short-term versus long-term. Just curious how, I mean, I'm sure it varies across all policies <laughs> and you need to look at the policy. But, but I do remember when I looked at like the group even versus the individual, like it, if you don't have a short-term, like, your long-term disability didn't kick in until maybe three months later. So the short answer to that is you are absolutely correct. It depends. Uh, I do tell people if your employer offers it, whether it's paid for by them or offered by them for you to pay for it, take it. Private short-term disability is really expensive. Mm -hmm. And in my humble opinion, I think that everyone, one of the first things that, that people should be doing financially is making sure that they have at least a three month nest egg, safety net, whatever you wanna call it, emergency fund. Most private disability policies, we're gonna run with a 90 day elimination period. Most group benefits, I would say right now, they're kind of split between 90 or 180. And that's the time between you calling me and saying, hey, Steph, something happened and us being able to get you paid. And it's one of a handful of ways to decrease the cost of the policy. And so we are seeing that more and more group benefits are pushing out to that six month mark. That's a long time to not get paid, mm -hmm. right? And so if they offer a short-term benefit, absolutely take it. And I've seen them ranging from, you know, kicking in after seven days, kicking in after two weeks, kicking in after a month. Some of them will only pay for a month. Some will pay for, I've seen a few, but some will actually pay for 52 weeks. And so again, it comes back to, you have to ask your HR department for these policies because they're not gonna just give it up to you. Yeah, that's some good stuff. Kevin? No, I, 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 I think this was fantastic. And I think <laughs> you, you took a very complex, a very complex product, product with an S on it, since there's so yeah. many different ways, and presented in such a way that really makes sense. So I'm going to, my takeaways from this is from the employer side, again, just recognize that any employer benefits is, is thinking from the employer's perception. Correct. So for me, if I was listening to this, I'd be going, okay, well, where am I in my career? If I'm a, in resident and training, or if I'm in early care practice, I will look at my employer benefits, but I'm going to want to talk to an independent insurance agent for sure, no matter what, Correct. because I want to be able to have my policy recognizing that I probably am not going to stay with this employer based on the way that physicians are employed now. And two, I want to make sure that I have someone who's looking for things from the best interests of me. And so that's, that, that would be my takeaway. And I, I think having some idea of those languages and the, you can request this data from our employers and then really sit down with an, with an independent agent who should be looking from your, from your best interest to craft the policies that suit you best, uh, what, for whatever stage of career that you're in. Correct. And additionally, there are specific discounts that tend to be available while you're in training that will stay with you moving forward as opposed to waiting until you're an attending. Now to confuse everybody more, there is one company and one company only that they got rid of their gender neutral pricing for trainees, but not for attendings. So there are a small group of women that may benefit um, from a reevaluation when they become attendings. I don't like anybody waiting. I am a believer in Murphy's law. 
uh, I think everyone should get covered as soon as possible. I have had residents and fellows go out. So that whole idea of I'm young and invincible just isn't really the case, right? Um, and so there, there is a subset of women where I will say, remember when I said you should only go through underwriting one time? Well, it might make sense to go through again. And so that just comes back to, again, kind of the relationship building between a client and a broker. From, from, a, from other standpoint, though, it, it makes sense, obviously, when you're in training, but there's going to be a group of physicians who either either their, their residency didn't even mention this, they didn't hear about it, and then they go out into practice and now they're like, hey, I'm five years out, I'm 10 years out, I have no idea. What would your recommendations be for them? So call me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no, going to second I that mean, recommendation you know, too. But, the, yeah. <laughs> you know, the truth of the matter is, you know, I do get a, a good number of folks who are more experienced. And, you know, I tend to say, look, you've won the game so far, right? You got through X amount of years staying happy, healthy, and intact. You didn't pay into this product. However, if we look at Vegas odds, if we look at actuarial data, you're more likely to go out on claim as you age. And so there's a function of playing catch up, right? And yes, it's going to be a little bit more expensive because you're a little bit older. May we have some limitations in what we can get because of the group benefit? Yes. You know, there are times we have to play within the confines of what we're presented. I spoke to a young woman today who was fortunate enough to have a $5,000 policy from training. She's now an attending, thought that she should be able to increase her private policy. But again, now, because she has this robust group benefit that she didn't realize what it was when I ran her real numbers. So by real, I mean her income and her group benefit. She actually only qualified for about $2,000 a month in benefit. And she was shocked. She was like, wait a second. I, th I, I thought I would qualify for like $15,000. And I said, well, the problem is your group benefit has a really high max and kudos to you for getting the resident package when you could, because it's going to be a while now before we can actually get you more coverage. And it was also a mistake I made. I didn't get it till I was attending and I qualified for less and it was more expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. But, but well, still do it. I mean, still talk to, I mean, don't, don't, don't wait 10 years out and say, Oh, right. I don't, it's I too mean, late it's, for me. <laughs> it's never too late. Uh, ever, ever, ever better late than never. Uh, you know, pricing is based on, are you a boy or a girl? How old are you? What do you do? Where do you live? And then they take into account, you know, other health issues and, and problems. And, and so there are certain things that potentially are, are issues. And one last point, and particularly yeah. if we have physicians in training, listen to this, I think how are things going now with COVID? Because when I'm hearing this and I'm hearing about residents being called now to cross cover different units that they're, you know, you're a dermatology resident also, and you're covering the ICU, you're putting in these mm -hmm. residencies are doing this. Um, it, are we seeing a shift in disability policies there? And if not, I would, are, are we saying go see your disability specialist now, if you're a resident physician? So I have to tell you on both the disability and life side, we're seeing some issues. And to be quite honest, more on the life side. Uh, on the disability side, all the carriers are asking at time of delivery. So they've made you an offer. Actually, I think they're doing it now on application too, but they're definitely doing it at time of offer where they ask you if you've tested positive or if you've had direct contact with a COVID positive person. Now for docs who are in full PPE, you have not had direct contact. If you're in full PPE, you're fine. Um, if you've tested positive, 
it's a 30 day hold and they will request a negative test or a letter from your health department saying that you've been cleared to go back to work. We have not yet seen any exclusions based on COVID, things saying we're not gonna cover future issues. I think coming down the pike, we absolutely will a hundred percent, especially since we're seeing all of these long COVID, um, I think that's what they're calling it right now, like the, the long COVID um, issues. I anticipate coming up the pike in 2021, 2022, it's gonna be a real problem. And so, yes, I think now is the best time Life insurance has gotten a little bit tricky. Anybody with pulmonary underlying conditions beyond mild asthma, the insurers really don't want to cover. Um, things like obstructive sleep apnea, we're having difficulty now. Um, we're finding, although no one's admitting it to me, anecdotally, I can tell you that people that have a history of depression and anxiety are getting lower health classes, meaning it's more expensive because the carriers really haven't figured out how to risk mitigate for this. And admittedly, the younger cluster aren't the people that are dying the most, right? And so some of the life insurance companies haven't taken as big of a hit as they thought they were going to, but it all trickles down. And since we don't know what these long lasting symptoms are gonna do, or if actuarially people are gonna start dying younger who have been exposed to COVID, they're trying to kind of bubble down and figure out how to spread the risk. And with mental health deteriorating during the stay at home and physicians who are getting burnt out and whatnot, I think that anybody who can get insurance now really should. I, I really think that coming up the pike, we're going to have a lot of problems. Yeah. Well, speaking of which, uh, we've, uh, you've illustrated quite well how complex and how much <laughs> help people need to review their policies and what's out there and what's ideal for them. Do you mind, this is a perfect segue for you to remind us again of where people can find you. So the website is www.pearsonrabbits.com. Uh, they can email me at stephanie at pearsonrabbits.com. Our phone number is 610-658-3251. I'm not sure how many people actually use the telephone anymore, but, uh, <laughs> you know, there you go. And uh, my name actually is my name on Facebook. I never thought to have an alias uh, to protect myself. But <laughs> well, that's that. And I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, we don't really have a big Instagram presence yet. We're working on it. Great. That's <laughs> wonderful. Well, Stephanie Pearson, thank you so much again for joining the Change Physician podcast uh, again uh, as a returning guest. <laughs> My pleasure. You guys yeah. are great. Well, thanks. And for all of you listening out there, I hope you took in a whole bunch of good <laughs> info because we all need to hear this, uh, maybe on repeat, uh, or just go ahead and give Dr. Pearson a call and she'll help you through all of this painstaking details um, of what's called disability insurance. So again, thank you for joining us on the Change Physician Podcast. I'm Melissa Cady, and I'm here with my co-host, Dr. Kevin Kakaro, and our lovely guest, Dr. Stephanie Pearson. We will see you next time. Take care. Thanks, guys. Bye.